Uh, my name is Brianna Berman, and I'll be moderating our panel tonight. Um, it's our pleasure to have Steve Jaros and Eric Lopal here with us tonight. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Steve is creative director of Delition and the head writer for Every Saints Row title. Um, Eric is a co-writer of Portal 1 and 2, um, in addition to contributing to many other popular Valve games. Um, so that you know the structure, we have a few questions prepared that um, came in from people before, um, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, since my introduction barely scratches the surface, um, I'll also let Eric and Steve uh, tell you more about themselves now. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Wolpaw, and I work at Valve. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and uh, I've worked on. So I've been there eight years. I've worked on. Co you know, writing every game since the orange box, so everything that's come out. And then before that, I worked at a company called Double Fine, and I uh, co-wrote a game called Psychonauts there. So that's kind of... More people clapping than, than bought Psychonauts, so... Shame on you. Pirating it. Yeah. Uh, I'm Steve. I get to stand next to Eric Wilpaw. Um, yeah. Pretty cool. Um, I'm uh, I'm the creative director of Volition. I've been there for eight years. Uh, before that, I actually uh, I was a, th a student here at the U of I, um, and yay. Uh, so um, yeah, that's um, my life is really boring. Uh, I'm, I'm less fabulous than Eric. No, no, my life's way more boring than yours. I would imagine. Debatable. Yeah. Anyway, it's a good debate forum for that. Problem. That's right. We'll see, we'll see you next week. Um, so now that we've heard a little bit more about each of you, um, what do you each consider your biggest accomplishments? <laughs> I, um, uh, I, w I won't lie, like, um, being paid to tell stories is one of, like, the coolest things in the world. Um, it's just, it's very humbling, and um, there's something um, so uh, magical when you see someone that you don't even know um, talk about, like you hear them talk about something that you've worked on, or you see them buy it in a store, and it's like, holy shit, man, like, like you just, like, this person that I, I don't even know has, um, um, is, is, like, seeing something that I did, and you see, like, you know, how many millions of people play a game or whatever, and like, oh my god, like, all those people heard my stupid jokes, and, and I get paid to make, to, to tell those stupid jokes, and it's just, it's so, um, it's humbling, and it's, it's really, really amazing. But as far as I think, um, uh, I've got to work with a bunch of, um, a bunch of people um, that I've always idolized in the entertainment industry, uh, and so that's kind of been uh, for me. Like, there's things that I never thought that I would do. Um, uh, various actors that I've idolized, and I've always like grown up watching. I'm like, oh my god, I get to I get to go and be in a room with Kane from Kung Fu. Like, that's awesome, you Did, know? Or when was that? Since we one, I worked. Really? Yeah, yeah. You, it was funny. Uh, David Carradine wore, like wore like a Three Wolf Moon shirt without the essence of irony, you know? Like he like he had like a fringe jacket the whole nine yards, and we were. Uh, um, he was playing a bad guy, you know, he thought that we were filming it, and so he goes in there to be this, like, bad, evil lawyer guy, and he, he puts on his jacket, and he, he lights a cigarette and puts on sunglasses, and the moment that he's like, oh, you, you can't smoke in the booth, sir, and, uh, and he realizes that he's not being filmed, he's like, oh, shit, okay, and just takes everything off and totally doesn't care, uh, uh, and that was pretty, uh, that was pretty neat, or, like, having a, um, like, uh, it's, just, it's, it's a lot of star fuckery. I don't want to. It's. I'll get drunk and talk about it later. But it's uh, working with people that I, that I that I respect and and I adore and, and a lot of those people are in my office. Like that thing is just so crazy. It's like like having a uh, working with people who inspire you on a daily basis is just great. Yeah, probably should have answered this one first because <laughs> your your heartfelt answer is pretty much everything I think too. But it's going to sound kind of stupid when I That's say right, that. Eric. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, every, everything Steve said, I mean, it's, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to make games, and there was no clear path to doing that, and it's just, it's consistently amazing to me when I stop to think about it that someone's actually letting me help make uh, games. Like, I, sometimes you're in the middle of it, you're working, and it's a job, and you're like, oh, it's a, you know, I wish I, you know, wish I could work at Subway or something, but then you step back for a minute and you're like, I cannot believe that this is me that's doing this, like working with these people and doing these things. So I guess that's it. Just being able to do it is the 
biggest accomplishment, which is basically what you said. So, all right. Said it better though. Being from well, it was certainly shorter. <laughs> so um, next up, what direction do you see the video game industry going um, in the future, and where would you like it to go? Uh, make them softer next time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jesus, I, I think um, I think that you're going to see a lot more stuff. Um, I think digital downloads not going away. I think that's uh, hope so. That's yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's that's going to be that's a big that's that's not stopping. Things are only going to go more in that direction. I think mobile is always going to be huge. I think everyone has a, everyone has a console in their pocket right now. You know, um, I think that that's going to continue to go and be big. I think um, yeah, consumables are huge, like DLC stuff. Like that's a really I don't think that's going to yeah, that's going to go away. You know, kind of the idea of a long ter uh, long tail sort of game, games as a service. Um, we have a game. Uh, Team Fortress, which I think is kind of a little bit the model of how uh, a lot of games hopefully will, will be like in the future, where it's this constant dialogue between the developer and the player base. Like, Team Fortress has been going for, I don't know when the Orange Box came out, five or six years ago now, and we still, I mean, I'm working on an update right now uh, for it, you know, a fairly big thing, and we just keep putting out new content and keep growing the game and players respond player numbers are up from five years ago it's not declining so I think I think you'll probably see more of that and probably a bunch of stuff that I mean we have no idea right that's ultimately so uh, I mean I wouldn't have predicted Minecraft so okay, so um, a little bit of a follow-up or kind of related at least um, recently there's been a big shift in gaming hardware controllers um, to things like Wii Remotes, Kinect, and Touch. Um, what do you think of this trend, and how do you think it's affecting games? Personally, or is some sort of like... <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I I like playing uh, Disneyland Adventures with my kid, but I, I mean, as far as I'm, if I'm playing Street Fighter, I want a fucking controller, you know? <laughs> like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, personally, I'm not a fan of the waggle control, but I think that's part of it is that I just grew up using a controller, a joystick, so that's kind of just what I'm used to, and, and I like that, and I'm scared of new stuff. So I think, uh, having said that, I pl I've played uh, at Double Fine. They made this Connect Adventure. Have you, no, is that what it's called? Uh, the, the, the Happy Fun Adventure, and that's, a pretty, that's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Um, so I'm happy to do that. I just don't, but that's not a game. I guess I don't actually, like, I don't want to ever have to do this to drive. I just don't want to hold my hands out ever because it's, it's hard. Right. Well, it's like, <laughs> like, there's certain games I think it works really well. Like, I think um, uh, Dance Central, I think, is pretty badass. Like, I, I thought that was a really, a pretty cool game. That used it a lot better than, like, Pump It Up or DDR. Uh, but, like, I'm not going to be like, pew, pew. I, I don't know. I'm sure there's probably a cool game there. I just, I, I haven't. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a. As you guys are probably no better than me, but uh, I'm sure. That, I'm sure there's something cool that can be done with it. I just don't. I don't know what that is right now. Yeah, as long as my hands are on my lap, right. and not moving. I just feel stupid talking to my TV. Like you can go oh. and like have. Yeah, like, I will that, say like, that. That fucking pisses Never. me off. There's a line in the sand. So, I'm not gonna. Xbox, Netflix. What the fuck? I'm on the Enterprise. I don't know. It's yeah. just. <laughs> I can't do it. I feel like a, I feel like my wife will come downstairs. My kid, will go, Dad, Daddy, what are you doing? I don't know. It's just it, nah. forget it. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we have um, a, a portal specific question. Um, how much of portal was designed to fit alongside Half Life's universe, um, and how much was just added after the fact? Wait, say it again. Um, how much of portal was designed to um, fit alongside Half Life's universe, and how much was added uh, kind of separately? Uh, it was. Excuse me, hold on. Uh, it was designed sort of from the beginning to be a piece of the Half-Life universe. And some of that uh, just rose out of the fact that when we were working on Portal 1, it was a group of, uh, they were basically kids from uh, a local game college called DigiPen. And then I was, they threw me in with them. But we didn't have a big enough team to make our own art assets, so we were reusing you know, 90% of the art was from Half-Life. So it just kind of made sense to try and put it in that universe. And then having said that, we put it, tried to put it in like a bubble. We sort of think a portal is existing in Aperture Science, which is this underground facility that just kind of anything can happen there, but it's all constrained to 
this underground facility. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily need to intrude too much on, on the Half-Life universe. Great. Um, and then, Steve, uh, one for you. Um, so between, you know, human, sh uh, human Shields and Dildo Bats, uh, Saints Row is a pretty over-the-top franchise. Uh, were there any ideas that were caught for being too extreme? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, some of them I can't say because I'm being taped. Um, but uh, like I, will, I will say that there, there was, it's interesting as the franchise has gone up, there are things that um, we, like when we talk about doing on Saints Row 2, that people are like, oh, that's too ridiculous. We can't go and do that. And then Saints Row 3, like, we'll suggest the exact same thing. And people go, oh, that's fucking awesome. Like, high five. I go, oh, all right. Uh, so, like, and, like, an example of that would be, like, in, in Saints Row 2, we wanted to do, like, the, um, you know, we wanted to have a sky fortress uh, rain death upon the city. And that's like, that's too ridiculous. And Saints Row 3 is like, we want a sky fortress that rains death on the city. Yeah, you know? And, uh, and there's some other things that, like, there, there's a couple pet pet things that I always wanted. Um, that um, I didn't uh, didn't get to do in three, but um, uh, I'm going to be doing in the future. So I don't want to go and spoil it from anyone. I will say something that, that didn't survive Saints Row three, um, but I wish kind of did. Uh, there was a, it used to be a subplot about um, uh, about the Saints wanting to go and do various um, acts of theater, and so there was like uh, a whole like subplot about a doll's house and about Ibsen and all this other like theater nerdery. Um, people said no one cares about theater, but you, Steve, like, ah, guilty. Uh, and so that 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 ate a bullet. Uh, but uh, but other than that, yeah. Um, okay, so this one's to both of you again. Uh, Portal is a rather linear game, while Saints Row is more of a sandbox. Uh, what would each of you consider the advantages and disadvantages of the two? The sandbox, I mean, love to work on sandbox game, partly because in a linear game, it's har find it's harder to put things that don't sort of feed directly into the experience or into the story on that linear path. I feel like, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, any crazy idea you have, you can find probably find a place for it in an open world game. Yeah. I mean, said that, I, yeah, having to record 100 characters and... Write 100 characters sounds like a, a nightmare. It's, it's, it's a, a bit much sometimes. But the, uh, the linear thing I think that, that we miss out on is that you are able to like, carefully craft a, um, a manicure um, moments that you're guaranteed that people are going to go and experience. You know they're going to encounter something on that journey, whereas a lot of times we go and put things out there and we don't know how much of it will be unseen content versus uh, things that they go through. And also because it's a... Uh, um, a lot of times in linear games, you can go and do a little more smoke and mirrors than you can in open world games because you have to go and create things for people approaching it from a bunch of different angles. Whereas if I know that you're only coming, like it's easy to make a linear game look better than an open world game because you're, you 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 know you're controlling what they can go and see at one point in time. So you don't have to worry about draw distance as much sometimes, and there's just like little technical doodads that that we kind of have to go and play soft and loose. That's why traditionally open world games don't look as pretty as say, Gears 3, you know, or, um, or like um, other open world games that do look good rely on using lighting to go and cover up some of their, their problems. Like um, Skyrim's a great example where if you, like, their facial in Skyrim is really not that good, but you don't care because you're impressed by the awe and spectacle of how amazing Skyrim is. You know what I mean? Like you look at the, those vista shots and everything, and you're so blown away that you don't focus on, on, like, um, on body animation because they don't need that. They don't need to go and put as much effort into that because they're not selling it as a a real tight experience is about this broad swath of things and I think missing that specificity can be a... Yeah, I mean, I feel like we do gain a big benefit just storytelling-wise from being able to... We kind of know in Portal or in a linear game sort of where the player's at emotionally as we move through the game, whereas they're just all, who knows, in Saints Row. Right. Okay, um, okay we have a question for Eric again. Uh, when writing Portal 2, uh, did you know what voice actors besides Ellen McLean would be reading those lines? Or did you have any idea as to who you imagined playing the characters? Um, uh, oh, is that the end of it? Um, sure. One more that goes along okay. with it. Uh, <laughs> have to get them all in. Uh, did the final choice of voice actors have any effect on the script in general? So we didn't know uh, right from the beginning. We had an idea... Uh, there's a character in Portal 2 named Wheatley who is played by Stephen Merchant, 
But originally, he was going to be played by uh, Richard Aoid, who's from the IT crowd, and he's another British comedian. And we'd sort of, we had it all worked out that he was going to do it, and so we were writing to him, and something happened at the last minute, and the schedules didn't work out. So we switched to Stephen Merchant, and it did affect the writing in that we listened to a, luckily he's got, he's been doing podcasts for 10 years, so we just listened to a ton of Stephen Merchant and kind of wrote in what we thought was, you know, his voice. And we had four sessions with him over the course of the project, and each one was four hours long. So as we went along, you start to learn kind of what, you, you never know what actors can say. It's the weirdest thing, like some actors just won't be able to say something. They just can't pull a particular line off. So the more you work with them, the more you start to know uh, what they're like. Uh, and J.K. Simmons, we didn't really know uh, originally, I think we we were writing with a different voice in mind. In fact, now still when we write, when we do Cave Johnson, I don't know if you do this, you do the voice in the room when you're writing, but we don't do J.K. Simmons' voice, we do our original voice, which, which was this southern guy, which sounds nothing like J.K. Simmons. Uh, so we just were doing our, our, you know, George Bush sort of impersonation. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then other than that, I think the only other voice really is Nolan North, and we just knew we were going to get him for the spheres, and we didn't really have any clear idea. We were actually just talking about this today with Nolan North, who's a guy who's in every game, but he's this <laughs> incredible vocal mimic, and what's fun is uh, you go into a studio with him. If you have a vague idea, you're going to spend an hour like finding the voice for the character, and it's just fun. I mean, it's, it's really, really fun, because he'll throw out, you'll be like, make that 5% more robot, okay, now 7% more Scottish, and he just does it. <laughs> uh, he can just do it. So, so yeah, there was a whole bunch, list of questions. Is that, I think I got through all of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then one for you, Steve. Uh, Saints Row is normally compared to games like Grand Theft Auto. Uh, what do you think of these comparisons? Um, I think it's great company. You know, I'm not. I don't get. I don't get offended uh, at all. I think. Uh, I do think that we're very different. I think that uh, we offer very different experiences. I think our game is uh, comedy, and GTA is more um, is more in a serious um, serious space. I think it's great. I think that people who want different experiences can go and have both, and they don't feel like you're repeating the same one. If you want, um, you know, a, a game about an immigrant. Like struggling about uh, inhumanity to man and what it's like to be a, a conflicted murderer, there is a perfect game for you, you know. Uh, and if you want um, want something um, different, uh, with a little more odd oddities and um, uh, of Tron homage and uh, a, th a throwback to Buffy, then you can go and play Saints Row, you know. And I think that that they they both exist high, side by side in two very different um, spheres, and so. Good, good for them. They sell a lot. They're good at what they do. So, but yeah. Um, and then one last question from me before we open up to the audience. Um, you guys are actually your friends and requested to do this panel together. Um, so. Oh. Yeah, it's a it's a small industry. Like people, everybody you either know everybody or you know somebody who knows somebody. So, it's a. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I think once you get in, I've never heard anybody leaving, like, not voluntarily. You're just, like, in for life. It's like the mob. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, and, and it's weird, because, like, you'll meet people that, like, I never even met. But it's like, oh, hey, did you know so-and-so? I worked him back, and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like you become war buddies all of a sudden. You're both telling stories about this other guy that you totally know can, like, just take two steps removed. And it's just it's really, uh, it's really nice. It's a very, very tight-knit Community. Yeah, and the other side of that is that, like, if you burn a bridge, like everyone knows you're an asshole, and like, <laughs> yes, but and yet you still get work. So uh, I don't know what you have to do to fail out. Yeah, it's less. It's it's, it's a weird. You know, it's not super corporate in a lot of cases. Yeah, at some point it's it's less like office space and more like Heather's. It's like there's a it's kind of clicky and and weird, but uh, it's a good job, generally speaking. Uh, but Steve and I are friends. Well, we were talking about this too. Is just there aren't. It's, it's kind of an odd job that we do writing for games because it's not a position that every company has. So there aren't a lot of people who have this sort of shared experience. And then of that small group, there's very, very few people that are writing, like, comedy games. So, like, it's Steve and me and 
That's basically, yeah. we're all here in this room. If a, if a bomb goes off, that's it. That's, Jesus yeah. No, what? Uh, that, that's my answer. Uh, uh, yes, we can. Someday, somehow, we will count to three. Yeah. Um, like it's complicated because um, so you just walked into a landmine. Um, the the Saints Row franchise was always meant to be silly, but the problem is that it was never um, we were never clear enough in in we, we failed in trying to go and articulate that in the previous iterations, right? Like Saints Row One, we knew that uh, we wanted to be like this kind of over the top. Like thing, like kind of like a hip hop videos, '90s hip hop, you know, and so you know, big cars and you know, excess and whatnot. And like, it was like we still had insurance fraud in Saints Row One. The original like prototypes of drug trafficking involved like like stabbing people with giant hypodermic needles to get them addicted to drugs. Like everything was still very like over the top, but it was it was it was too close to its source material. I remember there was a Penny Arcade thing um, where um, they they like they savaged savaged it, and they um, they're like, oh, you know, the the writing. You know, and it's like kind of you know, it's gangster dialogue feels feels like it's close to parody. It's like it was parody, but we didn't go far enough, and so people didn't know that. So instead of instead of actually coming across as a comedy, it came across as being maybe um, possibly out of touch to some people. It's like fuck, okay. So then it's like Saints Row Two comes around. It's like all right, we're gonna go try to push it a little further, and so you know, we do like a voodoo gang. We put katanas on people's back, like in Kill Bill, and we try to go and amp that up a little bit, right? But still, it still wasn't wasn't quite quite there. And then finally, it's like fuck it. You know, let's let's tell you know what I mean. Like let's just just go and and be 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 over the you know just just really put it out there because um, if you don't, it's like people always wonder if you're doing it on purpose or if it's just you know is it so bad it's good or whatever. It's like no, it's, let's just let's just make it clear that we're telling we're trying, we're trying to have fun and that's it. Uh, that isn't true, but um, yeah, Jay and I, uh, the co-writer on Portal, wrote we wrote the appendix of the of the what has or no the glossary. But I don't know. Nobody has to. You don't have to. You don't have to do anything. Nobody's your boss at Valve. I can't. I can't tell you to do anything. It's almost like a trick question. <laughs> when each of you get a question, could you repeat it into the mic and then answer it, just so that. Sorry. No, 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 I didn't even mention it before, so thank you. Why are you judging me? <laughs> um, so, this is for both of you. Um, writing the campaign versus writing DLC for you or writing like a long-term support game like Team Fortress 2. Um, how do you both prepare for later iterations of your story, and then how do you manage to add on to a story that you've already written? You have a different process. Uh, so, it, the, so the que the question is. Oh, yeah. Oops. Uh, <laughs> she'll cut you. Be careful. Yeah. Um, the 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 question uh, was how do you uh, how do you go and prepare for um, a, like a long tail game or DLC or uh, right what what do you do to go and get ready for that? Is that yeah? Okay. I, so. A lot of it's just looking for, you're usually so pressed for time trying to get the initial thing out that you may draw, you may put a few hints in there, but if you have some outstanding gags, you're, they're, they're going in the game because uh, you're desperate for stuff by the end. So usually it's, it's looking, at least for us, it's looking at what's there and figuring out, you know, there, there's always some opportunity to, to move it forward. Uh, just like in Portal, the first DLC, Portal 2, uh, there's a bird that appears in Portal 2 that I was way more into than everyone else. And uh, <laughs> I wanted the bird to be all over the place. But it didn't really get an ending, it just flew away. So the first DLC, I got my wish and it's all about the bird. You, you fight the bird at the end and it comes back and it's a, it's a big deal. So like that, 
that I, so, sometimes you can explore some missed opportunities. In TF, we just, we keep building this, this ridiculously more and more complicated, like, uh, canon and introducing new characters. And uh, we do sort of have, we, we do have a plan for that. But even then, there's opportunistic stuff that drops in, uh, and w which is the good thing. I mean, being able to react to what people like. Like in Team, Team Fortress, somebody, well, you know, people respond to the oddest things. Uh, you know, in Left 4 Dead, did I think when we were recording Lewis saying pills here, was I like, that's it. Like, we're going home for the day. This is the one. Uh, no, I mean, people like pills here. I don't know why. Uh, so, yeah, you, you can't predict that stuff. Yeah, I mean, he pretty much said it better. Um, you win this round, Mr. Wolfhawk. Yeah. Like we, uh, so the question is, how how often do we play test our worlds yeah. to see like, if the if the jokes are working and stuff like that, or just in general? Uh, we focus test evolution a lot. We bring in people to go and uh, look at it. Um, you know, uh, get get people's feedback. That's something that we we believe in pretty pretty heavily. Um, it's always hard because sometimes, like when you're doing usability testing, a lot of times you um, your questions that you have can totally go and impact the results that you get. Because it's like if you go and say stuff like. Did you feel such and such at mission three? It's like, they might not have even been thinking about it, but now that you ask them, like, oh, well, wait, what did I feel? I don't know if I did. You know, and am so, I going to be dumb if I didn't feel? Right? That? Yeah, I felt everything. You know, and yeah. so it's it's a tricky it's a tricky thing, but um, but we we definitely do um, do do um, research. It's a dangerous thing to go and think that like you're so brilliant that everything you do is going to be great the first time. Like you have to go and have other people go and check out and call you on your bullshit. Yeah. Uh, Oh, uh, and so at Valve, we don't have a QA department, so it's up to the teams to play test their own games. So yes, and it's, it can be painful because it's, you're just hearing these missed opportunities, especially beyond the point of no return, the, all the things you could have done. It's just, it's not funny anymore. You're second guessing yourself. So what Jay, Jay and Chet, Chet's another writer there, and I do is we always try and sign up for play testing. Once we know that the stuff's hooked up right, like for the then the long slog of play testing, we'll try and sign up to play test the localized version. So we're hearing the French people. We have no idea what they're saying, and it it sounds sound that I bet that joke's funny in yeah. English. I don't remember what it was, but I mean, I think you you have to go and and you can't just throw something off the wall like write it and then just toss it and go. Okay, guys, have fun with that one. I'll see you later. Um, like you I mean you have to go and uh, go to mission reviews and see where it's at. Or is, is that joke working the way I thought it was going? And yeah, and it, well, along with playtesting, we also hook our own audio up because um, it just so happens that the writing staff that we're using on Portal and Left for Dead, we were all were engineers at one point too. So we we write it, we record it, and we put it in the game. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, having said that, after the game ships, I tend not to ever play it again. Uh, maybe someday I will. I feel like I should play it more, but... Well, I don't, yeah. once it ships... Fuck it. I mean, the multiplayer... Well, the, the one thing is multiplayer games are always fun. You can play those forever. Like, if you're, you want advice for making a game, make a multiplayer game, because you won't get sick of it by the time it ships, because it'll just be fun. What do I think of the phrase hat simulator? It's actually not hat, it's war-themed hat simulator. Uh, and I like it. I, it I, uh, people love the hats. Who would have thought? People like hats. Uh, yes. Oh, I'll, I'll say the question while you're thinking of an answer. What advice would you give, Steve, to people who want to break into game writing? Oh, good God. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky, I think, that um, there's a lot of 
So how is it this catch-22 that happens in the games industry where a lot of times people say, like, we're looking for a person who's got experience, but how do you get experience of all the jobs? You're saying looking for people with experience, and it's kind of like, Jesus, what do you do? Um, I think... Um, there's a couple, like a couple of best practices as far as if there's a job and you're applying for it. Um, uh, general like traps that people go and make when they're doing a writing application or they're trying to go and impress people. One is that um, they try to go and sound so smart all the time. And I think that like sometimes when you're writing like pedestrian dialogue, people will feel like, oh, this is my chance to go and show people how great. I, I, I did the same thing when I first started writing it. But at the end of the day, there's only so many ways you can go and say, please don't shoot me, right? <laughs> and sometimes it's OK to just go and have help, you know, and that works. Um, and so like, you know, you'll have these, um, these writing tests that we'll send out for people to go and help write like pedestrian dialogue on Saints Row. And sometimes you get back these these things that are like paragraph answers for each of these these lines because they're trying to go and like they want to go and impress like how good of a writer they are and they want to go and show like oh I can go and have this thing talking about his father or whatever and at the end of the day I'm just looking for someone to say please stop and that would have been good enough and we still do this uh, not we Steve and I I don't know if you do it but well, I, uh, I fuck it up yeah but we <laughs> right, you haven't heard what I'm I'm this is. Uh, but it's kind of like what you're saying. We, we underestimate when we're writing. We forget sometimes that there's an art direction to the character. The character looks like something and has a voice. So, like, please shoot me from different looking characters with different voices sounds very, please don't shoot me, it sounds very, very different. Uh, so there's that. Um, there's all, we also sometimes have a tendency, like, if I'm a biker, I'm going to make a lot of lines that reinforce I'm a biker. When you don't really have to do that because he sounds like a biker, he looks like a biker, the context is biker, so he doesn't need to constantly talk about that. The other advice I'd give is just more broadly, doesn't really have anything to do with writing, but has to do with game writing, is get some experience working with actors if you can, because that's a shock to the system. Like, that's a whole other skill that you're going to be asked to do um, and it's, it is actually a skill. You think you just go in there and tell them just act, but it, it doesn't actually work out that way. Um, and I would also suggest learn some programming just because it gives you, you're able to communicate with the people on your team, uh, and you're also potentially able to have a little bit more control over how the story gets deployed in the game. Uh, and it's really not that hard to learn. You know, give yourself a year to screw around with it. Doesn't you're not you don't have to program the physics engine or anything. Just learn some some Lua or Squirrel or whatever. Uh, um, and one other thing on that, um, like there's also lots of venues where you can go and like there's conferences and whatnot where they have like job fairs where people are going and trying to go and do recruiting and whatnot. Like next week in Austin, there's a, a, a game writer summit in Texas, um, and um, and people are going there. And there's a lot of people who are students or people who are trying to go and break in the industry that go there. And one of the number one mistakes that people can go and make at that place, it kind of goes back to what we touched, talked about earlier about like the industry being so close, is like just don't be a jerk. You know, because oh yeah, that kind of goes out. Yeah, don't be, yeah. A, don't no, be but, a jerk. And it, but it's like, but it's weird because it, se it seems so common sense, but like it's really, it's really true. Like there's people when like they go and come up and try to talk about how great they are, and like, oh, if you give me this job, I'll, I'll blow away anything that's done by Bethesda. Like, okay, that's cool. And then they send you their resume. And it's like, oh, well, all right. Like, do I, do I really want to work with someone who thinks that they are their God's gift? You know, and that makes that that stays with you. You know, one, one of the writers at Valve just. I think last week, I think it was last week at the Eurogamer Expo, gave a talk about how to give yourself a job in the game industry. And the other thing is you don't need to, I mean, it's you can make a game yourself. And it's, at least at Valve, that's one of the best ways to get a job. Like, we're not just going to hire for a position because we need somebody to write some lines for us. Like, you need to actually have made something. But it's not unreasonable to get together with a few people and actually make something amazing. Like, that's the best, best way to, to get a job, especially at Valve, but I would say probably anywhere. I mean, you're much more likely to take someone, to hire someone who did something that blew you away, right? I mean, like the first the first day of any design uh, design interview at Volition is we have them do a presentation about some stuff that they did, you know? And even if it's just like, oh, here's a game I made with Game Maker, or here's something, here's my little text adventure, it's like, oh, just show us what you did, you know? What, what have you worked on? What do you, you know, just, it's just nice. Yeah, I mean, everybody we've ever hired has been, uh, on the writing side, has been because they've done something where one or more of the writers were like, we cannot ignore this person. Like, make it so we can't not hire you. I mean, that sounds kind of stupid. But uh, just do something, do something great. Do something. Yeah, do something. <laughs>
Uh, so the question was about narrative structure uh, within games as opposed to other forms of media. And uh, games, I think one of the problems is that it used to be, well, it, it's painful, but a lot of times you have to be very didactic in games. So like a lot of the reasons why in games, if you have someone, you have a custom, they talk about what you have to go and do, and then once you're in gameplay, they kind of repeat a similar thing to what you just saw in the cutscene, is because if the person buttoned through all the cutscenes, you still have to know what they're supposed to go and do. So they have to go and, and reinforce that. Or conversely, you don't know, if, like if you're watching a movie, you know, it's safe to assume that they saw the beginning of the movie, the middle of the movie, before they got to the end of the movie. But when you're playing a game, you don't know if they played for a day, you know, they play it all in one time. Do they go and they stop and go on a vacation? Do they come back? You know, what's, what's, what have they done in between that? And so a lot, of, a lot of your time you have to go and kind of reinforce where you're at because you're not sure where the user has been between the moment that they were playing and, and the next moment. Yeah, and just, it's kind of like writing, the writing is more front and center, I think, in a movie or a TV show. And in a game, it, I always think of it more as like a soundtrack. It's there to sort of enhance what's going on. Uh, the narrative is there to make the gameplay better, to provide some context and uh, make you feel, kind of like music helps tell you how to feel about a certain thing. I, I kind of feel the same way about a story in a game. And short, shorter is better, right? As short as you possibly can. Uh, I mean, it's always probably good advice, but better advice even in writing I'm, for a game. The, and Saints Row 1, that was like my first cutscene that I wrote and I was really excited about it. My producer looks at it and goes, Steve, what the hell did you do? I'm like, what do you mean? It's this, this good monologue. It's like, Steve, you wrote a, a, a full page monologue. I'm like, yeah, like it's great. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you got four lines. Um, because otherwise you're going to be staring at this dude talking for, you know what I mean, like two minutes and no one wants to go and, you know what I mean? Like that's, right. not, that's so not what you want. You can get around it by just having a character follow you around and babble constantly. Uh, so that, that's a trick. Uh, yeah. Who, who is the, my favorite character? Um, I'm trying to think. I like, there's a, one of the cores at the end of Portal 2, there's this adventure core that's this completely <laughs> impotent thing that he's just a ball. He's literally a ball that can't do anything, but he's kind of filled with a lot of optimism and self-confidence. And I, I like that guy a lot. Uh, so yeah, I guess right now maybe he's, he's my favorite. Rick the Adventure Sphere. Yeah, he's got his own theme. He's, he just, you can't break his spirit. He literally can do nothing. Uh, <laughs> but he's just, he's got such a good attitude. Uh, Nolan North, ladies and gentlemen, Nolan That's North. Right. Oh, it's really hard. Uh, there, I'm trying to think. Uh, if I had to pick one from the stuff that you have seen, um, uh, I would, uh, I... I really like Josh Burke a lot. Uh, he's like this 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 uh, douchebag actor guy in Saints Row Three, and I I really not necessarily even Josh's lines so much as I liked writing him as Nightblade. Like I liked writing the like the Nightblade radio drama, and so uh, that was just always fun to go and just be t uh, like offensively overwrought, and so that that always made me smile. What kind of issues do we run into when we're trying to convey the story to developers? Um, well, so I, I'm not the the hierarchy is a little bit squishy at Valve, so everybody's sort of developing. So you're, but you still have to pitch your ideas. Part of it is just being confident about it. I mean, so I would also, uh, in terms of being a game writer, I would also suggest you take some acting lessons along with learning to direct because you need to be on. You need to sell that idea. Like if you're in there and you're like mumbling, you're not sure yourself what this idea you're pitching, nobody else is going to want to do it. Um, but, uh, so be confident, be able to pitch it, um, take, take people's feedback. The thing is, to working with developers is you're writing this thing and you're making a ton of work yeah. for people that you work with and like and uh, you're potentially giving them months of work. So you just want to make sure that everybody's on board with the idea and that it makes sense. You just don't want to send people. You can mock it up a little bit and then play test it and see if it's working. But uh, I guess 
besides selling it, also be honest with yourself. Be willing to let these things go uh, because there's going to be a bunch of stuff that even if you're sure it's going to work down the road, if you push every single one of those, you are making a ton of work for people and you're going to be wrong a lot of the time. What is, again, Steve's favorite thing in a game uh, that people haven't noticed? Um, it's really nerdy. Um, there's two, there's, shit, all right. So uh, there's two, there's two that, that, that stand out to me. Um, uh, first one is that I'm a giant, I'm a giant fucking nerd. And so uh, in Saints Row 2, we had these like, like action nodes where people could go and just do things in the background like, do um, uh, you know, like do yoga or tai chi or whatever? And one of the ambient things that you could go and have people do um, is go and um, play rock paper scissors. But all their lines are talk about vampire LARP because um, in vampire LARP, it's just to play rock paper scissors. And so I had like this, this little like subplot about people doing this vampire LARP in Saints Row Two, uh, and that made me really happy. Uh, and the other one is, and this is like, this is going even like, deeper nerd, it's like theater nerd shit. Uh, and since Josh Burke uh, has a line where you're grabbing him, um, as you, you abduct him as a human shield in one of the missions, and you're, you're, you know, you're escaping with him. And at one point he says, all right, guys, this is classic Bowal. And uh, Augusto Bowal was a guy who performed, uh, this, he was the, the founder of Theater for the Oppressed, which is this big social issues theater movement. And so the idea that like, this guy's in the middle of this gunfight and he's talking about this big social issues theater thing always made me smile, but no one's going to fucking <laughs> care. But that's, for me, that's my, that's my thing. Yeah, we, we, there's almost nothing we hide in the games that people don't find because they make lots of connections that we didn't even plan. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to even catch up with them. Like, uh, there's a character in Portal 2 named Carolyn, and uh, we, na we just needed a name, and Jay's mom's name's Carolyn. So we were like, okay, Carolyn. And then it turns out that Carolyn means free man. So <laughs> we, we didn't know. We had no idea. No idea. Uh, until the game shipped and someone was like, free man. Yeah, I don't know, that's Jay's mom. Uh, <laughs> the one thing that nobody really ever seems to pick up on, and it's not really that big a deal and it's pretty obscure, is that Jay and I are big uh, Louis L'Amour fans. He's a guy who wrote Western novels in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, if you look, like 90% of the characters we made are all taken from Louis L'Amour books, like their names, uh, which is not entertaining but interesting. Not even that interesting, but there, there it's it is. Augusta Bowal, you yeah. win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is kind of goes with what you just answered. Um, what is your favorite game that you've played that you wish people would have seen earlier? What's the weirdest thing that caught on? Both of you guys. Greatest thing that ever caught on? You're just like. Uh, what's the weirdest thing that caught on? I mean, Pills here is up there. Uh, <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to think what else catches on. Uh. Um, <laughs> there was, uh, for some reason, every once in a while, like, you, you know, I, you know I, I read a lot of forums because I'm neurotic. And, and, and it's not like a, a story thing at all, but like things that people at the end of Saints Row 1 were really like, like having a thing about was like why are there no fingerless gloves in Saints Row and like this was like, like this big like there was it was a grave sin that we committed it's like okay we'll, we'll get the fingerless gloves in but uh, it was just, it was a big I don't know people really really focused on that uh, yeah and I'll I'll just go with pills here I think that's, <laughs> that was it. Uh, if Psychonauts 2 got funded, would I be able to work on it? Um, you know, I could. I, Valve's pretty good about that stuff. I'm sure they would let me take a sabbatical uh, to do it. I don't know how long it would take. Um, and also, you know, Tim would have to. Yeah, I don't think I could just show up and be like, I'm, "Hey guys, I'm, I'm working here now." Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I would love to do it if if the opportunity presented itself. Uh, so, yes, I think it would be possible. The other one is, can you unveil anything about the Halloween update of Team Fortress 2? 
I cannot, other than it's, there will be a Halloween update of Team Fortress 2 uh, coming soon, and it probably will involve a hat. Yes. <laughs> How many game ideas after a night of heavy drinking? I don't actually drink that much, so not much, although Rick the Adventure Sphere was written in a flop sweat panic the night before we were going to record at the, the hotel bar. I mean, we had a general idea, but we didn't have any lines, so that one, I guess. Uh, Volition has a kegerator. <laughs> Uh, so what do you do with Valve if people are not <laughs> focusing on, I, look, can you just say it? Like, say, people aren't focusing, are, like, aren't focusing on a single project and making a lot of different, like, Well, so, uh, it isn't complete anarchy the way it may seem in the book. You know, everybody is clearly, it, we tend to hire people who are product focused and it's hard to do anything by yourself. So you need to become part of a group or you're not going to get anything done. Um, and so you find the group that's working on something, you become part of that group. Uh, if there are disputes, playtesting is a great way to resolve those disputes. And we, Valve actually tends to hire people who are sort of, especially for CS people, very verbal and you know good at kind of working through things and talking. And it just works out. Uh, it works out. In terms of if people are failing, there are, you know, we do everything we can to, you know, get them back on the right path. Um, you know, not a lot of people leave Valve, so it tends to work. You know, the, the uh, hiring process is, is tough. So once people get in, we're usually pretty sure they're, they're a good fit. Uh, so what do we think about the Mass Effect 3 ending? Uh, I, Steve has actually told me what a big Mass Effect fan he is. I have not actually played it, but I will tell you from just from writing that endings endings are a bitch. They are hard to do. Uh, pretty easy to start your story, very difficult to end it. Uh, and so with that said, on to you, Steve. Right, so there's a, there's a couple. <laughs> so, no, uh, uh, so a couple things. Um, one, uh, Mass Effect 2 is actually my favorite game on the, um, this console generation. I, I love it more than, than, than cake. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, and possibly my daughter. But, um, po possibly, be fair, uh, the, um, uh, Mass Effect 3, I, First of all, the ending didn't bother me in Mass Effect 3. Um, the other 40 hours before the ending did. So, like, my, my gripe with Mass Effect 3 isn't the ending. It's a lot of other, like, I can go off that for a, a dark place for a while. But the ending didn't bother me. I think that, uh, as a developer, uh, I think it kind of, um, I think it's kind of a bummer that uh, they felt the need to go and have to go and patch their ending. I don't know. It just seems kind of yeah. You, know, you spend you spend a lot you spend a lot of time trying to go and tell a thing, and you do it, and people hate it so much that you feel compelled to go and issue a patch. It just seems kind of shit. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really. I, I should have followed the story more. Did it work when they patched the ending? I don't know. Were people happy, or were they just more angry? Yeah, I mean, like I, like I said, the problem for me is like that fucking Mass Effect Three. Like I, 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 
I'm not an objective person to answer that question. And neither one of us then, because I, I, I truly it haven't played it, I, and I don't know what they're... But I mean, it, it, is a, it, it is a nightmare scenario. I mean, if we had put Portal 2 or Saints Row 4 out and people hated the ending so, so much that they were up in arms about it, I mean, that would be, that would be awful. Like, the reality is that any time someone says that something sucks, like, some people spent three years of their life making that thing that you, like, you took 15 seconds to go and shit on on a blog post. You know what I mean? Like, and that's hard, right? Because like, these, are, these, are, these are our friends. I mean, they're people, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people at Bioware, you know, and so it's just like, Anytime someone goes and bags on a game, it's like, okay, they, they're doing the best that they can. There's probably a bunch of reasons for why they made the choices that they made. Um, and sometimes, and at the end of the day, the consumer doesn't have to go and care because you're $60, you know, and it's... Yeah, certainly. But, but it's, 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 it's an empathy it's that... Some, once, you're, once you're making games, it changes your perspective in terms of critiquing games because you're just too aware of what it actually takes. I mean, to a certain, not that Mass Effect was a bad game, but it's more effort to make a, a shitty game than a good game because you're making a shitty game and it's a ton of work and you're like, this isn't actually that good a game. Well, and like a great example to, to tag along with that is like, like Dragon Age 2 is a great example. Like when Dragon Age 2 came out, there was, I mean, a lot of people were like, oh man, like this game was rushed and I can't believe that it came out and, and why is it not like it was in Origins and, you know, X, Y, and Z. And for me, it's like, holy shit, man, they made an RPG in a year? That's incredible. I can't believe those guys did it. They're rock stars. Like for me, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, like this is, a, this is an incredible act of will that they did to go and make that and like that's amazing uh, and so it's 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 hard for me to go and and like do that give me a, give me a beer though and we're fine yeah. <laughs> I can arrange Uh, so, uh, when did Team Fortress 2 start getting a story because it didn't really have one to be... Right. Uh, so, yeah, I do write the story with Jay Pinkerton. Um, and a lot of it is just finding entertaining ways to, you know, we, we want to present an update, we want to introduce some new thing, and we don't just want to say, here's this new thing. Uh, we'd like to try and fictionalize it. And so we just started doing that, and people responded to it, and they liked it. And so we just kept going with that, and we kept getting this more and more complicated story. And at some point, we were just invested in the story of Team Fortress 2, and we, we really enjoy working on it. So it's just, it's this evolving, evolving thing. You know, we kind of, Jay's a big comic book fan, and you know, we were able to get comic book artists and start doing comics. And, you know, we just found all these story delivery devices for Team Fortress 2, and we found that they, they, helped, uh, they helped people enjoy the updates, basically. Even though they existed outside the game, it, uh, providing that context really, maybe not everybody playing T Team Fortress 2, but a lot of the player base also came along and started to get invested in, in the story and the presentation of the updates. Um, so the question was about uh, telling storytelling through like through mechanics and what role do we the writers play in that? Uh, every studio is different. Uh, at Volition, a writer is an integrated member of the design team. They go to the design meetings. They contribute like everybody else. Um, you know, they uh, it, it's all part of the process. And so for us, it's I mean, the designers drive a lot of it. But I mean, we're we're all one team, all working out together. It's the same thing at Valve. Valve doesn't have any pure design position, so everybody contributes to design and then has, for lack of a better term, a practical skill to, to, uh, that they also bring to the table. And so everybody contributes to design as well as doing their, their kind of core competency. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Who has an awesome one? <laughs> Game 
curious yourselves, what game or games uh, really impressed you the most and stand out? Uh, what what games impressed us uh, as game writers? I mean, there's a huge list of them. You know, everything Schaefer does is is pretty great. Um, but recently, uh, last year, Driver San Francisco, I was really impressed with because I kind of went in thinking it's just sort of a game writing nightmare scenario in that they want it's going to be uh, this sort of hard edged car chase game, but also has this weird mechanic where you're in a coma the whole time and you can float around like a ghost. Also, you can't leave the car, and they still need to tell a compelling story, and they did it, I thought. I thought they told a really great story, uh, given all these crazy constraints, like more constraints than you would normally have on a game. So recently, that, that would be an example. Uh, the, the games in recent memory, um, I like Portal. Uh, no, I. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, also, no. see, three shows have been good too. Yeah, yeah. see, no, um, yeah. no, no, uh, the, 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 the really pop out um, as well, though. Um, I, lo I, I do love Mass Effect 2. I think Mass Effect 2 did a great job in, in, in building up a mission and letting you try to go and get you excited about your final goal and really give a sense of connection with your teammates and, and push that forward. I think the darkness was incredibly successful in giving a sense of loss and making you go and really care about your girlfriend. There's this great scene in the in the darkness where, I don't know if you ever played it, like, there's... Um, you go and it's, it's a game about mobsters and, and possessed with the demon. You eat hearts and shit. But like, you go to your girlfriend's house and she's it's your birthday and she gives you like a little a little cupcake or whatever. And you sit down and you watch um, uh, you watch To Kill a Mockingbird and they, they actually have it playing on like they bank it so it's kind of cool. Yeah, whole movie. And you sit down as you're sitting down. Like, you know, your girlfriend kind of goes and cuddles up with you, and you put your arm around her, and she kind of puts her head on your lap, and she kind of falls asleep. And, and as you're cuddling there, you have, you have a couple, like, you know, odd questions. Well, how are you doing? How's your, how's your birthday? And just a name conversation with your girlfriend. And then at one point, a dialogue option comes up, and one of them is uh, tell her that you love her. And so you, have, you go and you pick it. You go, oh, hey, Jenny, never mind, I'll tell you later. And I'm like, holy shit, that's awesome. And so, so you do that, right? And then that moment when she gets put in, in danger, in jeopardy, like, oh my god, I have to save her. This is my girlfriend. Like, I love her and I'm going to go and protect her. And like, it was so, it was so evocative. It really, it really pulled me in. And I, 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 like, hook, line, and sinker. I was, give me more. So, I was a big fan. And Prince of Persia is badass. I want to thank everyone for coming out, and I want to thank these two for being here. So. Thank you. Thanks.